Hi, I'm Lisa Savage. Welcome to Pathways to Progress. I'm here at the Portland Media Center tonight with newest uh, Portland City Councilors, Victoria Pelletier, Roberto Rodriguez. We're going to talk about their uh, experience being learning to be city councilors and the progressive issues and um, policies that they'd like to see happen in Portland and how you can help that happen. So thanks for watching. Victoria, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Yes, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Victoria Pelletier. I am the new city councilor for District 2. So District 2 is essentially the West End, Parkside, Valley Street, um, and Oakdale neighborhood. So yeah, congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Roberto? And I'm Roberto Rodriguez. I'm the new at-large councilor on the uh, city council in Portland. So, you have how many city council meetings under your belt at this point? <laughs> Seems like hundreds, I know. Three already, right? It's only three. three. It's only it's three. An only three. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I was telling them I watched the recording of Wednesdays, and at the top of the screen it said that it started at 5 p.m. and it was going to end at 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. like, oh my god. <laughs> but that it didn't really go that long, did it? We, have, we haven't gotten that close yet, but the, the, all of the meetings, I think, have gotten to like 9, 30, 10. Mm -hmm. So they've all been like four or five hours. And, you know, I actually thought at the last one it would be a, a shorter one because we had a short agenda and that was foolish of me because it still ended around mm -hmm. 9, 30, so. And that's after you've worked all day? Yep. Mm -hmm. Tell yep. us a little bit about what do you do for work? Yeah, um, so I work at Portland Empowered. Um, so I work uh, with kids and parents, uh, mainly immigrant kids and parents, who are navigating the Portland school system. And it's really helping them advance policy, it's helping them get involved, and, and really being part of the conversation in terms of what curriculum is being taught and how to make sure that we are teaching an anti-racist, inclusive curriculum. So that is what I do most of the time. And then I'm also um, a community facilitator with integrative inquiries. And so I go into businesses and have conversations with them around uh, collaborative efforts and power dynamics and, uh, again, equity and anti-racist practices and really helping uh, workers feel like their, their, their words and, and their opinions are, are valid and matter and, and really helping them kind of navigate conversations with their bosses around uh, feeling included and feeling like their voices are being amplified. So you're going to be a real asset on the Portland City Council. I yes. hope so. <laughs> this is important work. At yeah, the municipal absolutely. Level. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Roberto, you have an interesting. You're self-employed, I think. You have your own business, right? Yep, I have a. I have a small business, but right now, uh, the majority of my time, I took a job back in September to be an interim co-director for Cultivating Community, mm -hmm. uh, which is a local nonprofit. Um, whose mission is um, centered on access to food or food justice. Um, so we have a couple of programs. I, I love hearing Tori um, talk about her work and how it really is related to public service and what we do in the city. I'm so happy in Cultivating Community, our programs are related to the schools and we're mm -hmm. also trying to involve curriculum um, that involves uh, nutrition and garden education. And uh, what's really cool, this week I was meeting with uh, the new outdoor learning coordinator um, to just figure out how does that curriculum then tie into the Wabanaki study, how does that uh, tie into the Africana studies, and make sure that we have this holistic approach to it. So part of the decolonizing the curriculum and part of like um, just being like bringing in those uh, marginalized voices to the center of, of the curriculum. So that's a big part of the work that we do in cultivating community. Um, and then the other aspects of it are we manage some of the community, not some of them, we manage all of the community gardens in Portland. Uh, and also we have a farm over in uh, Falmouth where we have a new American training or farmer trainer program. Um, and so that's been taking up the majority of my time. Um, super exciting work and like I said, <clears throat> ties into a lot of the work that we're doing in public service. Um, my small business, this time of the year is when I'm starting to get ready for the season. So I'm just reaching out to clients, making sure that I have um, their garden plants ready and um, getting things lined up. Um, but like I said, it's, you know, the council work, it's still on top of everything that you live. Mm -hmm. We were talking before, <laughs> before we got into um, the room about balancing, you know, our life and our, our families, our health, and the time that, that, it devotes, the, that we put into the council. So I'm still trying to figure that out, you know, mm -hmm. where that balance lives. That's a tricky one. Mm -hmm. You probably know I was a teacher for many years, so, and my granddaughter now goes to Reiki school, and the first time that I was at Reiki, like playing on the playground with them in the summertime, I realized they had such a great garden there. Yes. Extensive mm -hmm. gardens. I mean, okay. Reiki's basically a community center as well as a school. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's such a, 
a strength of programs and yeah about the self-care I remember I was a career change teacher and so I was already a, a mom with kids at home and I was doing my student teaching and there was a teacher that would stay at the school until like two in the morning and you'd come in in the morning and she was just like frantic and I can remember saying to myself I can't be that I, I could see that I have the you know potential to be that teacher of wanting to do everything and get it all done and realizing wow you you really have to set some boundaries and say if I'm not centered and taking care of my health like how am I going to do this very demanding, mm -hmm. demanding job mm -hmm. well I hate to uh, change to a possibly touchy subject, but let's talk about emails for a second. Do you guys get a lot of emails from city councilors? Yeah? <laughs> we get a few, yeah. yeah. They trickle in, yes, they trickle in. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, it's, it's it, I think it will ebb and flow, but for the most part we do get a ton of emails, of course, because I think that's, that's the quickest way people can feel like they can access us. All of our emails obviously are public, and I think for those of us, like I'm a big social media person, but I definitely get more communication just via um, email before the meetings, absolutely, especially if we're talking about, you know, everything that we talk about is intense and emotional um, for different reasons, but definitely the before the meeting, during the meetings, and afterwards, and then it's, it's, I think it will ebb and flow, but for the majority of time, because we're talking about such intense things and, you know, the state of the world and the state of Portland, I, I think the emails will just continue to, to come in pretty heavy. Yeah, absolutely, I think the, um the volume of emails is something, but I think the, the other part that I take away from it is, even though our vote ultimately, you have two, two choices, right? You're either gonna vote something uh, um, for it or against it. But in the emails, you really see how complicated the issues get, how many different aspects mm -hmm. to, to or how many different points of views there are, how our decisions impact people, and um, it really is not as easy as, yes, I'm for it, no, I'm not. Um, it, it does, you have to weigh in, you know, how things are impacting people in a really unique way. So the emails are super valuable. Um, and, and to that point, when it's so many of them and it's so many points of views, yeah. you're like, you honestly, you're, you're uh, conflicted at times. Uh, oh, sometimes it's super clear. Uh, and yeah. other times, it's just not. Mm -hmm. So the emails are, are, again, part of that learning curve. Yeah, I've, yeah. So <laughs> how steep is this learning curve? Is this like... To be the target. This? <laughs> like this? Or like this? Or? I think it's like this. Like, okay. 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 Um, yeah, I think in some... For some things, a lot of it is... I'm not, not easy, but familiar to me. I mean, and I think that comes from equity work, that comes from community facilitation work, where all I have to do is have conversations, and I have to have conversations with people that maybe have very different um, and opposing views, and I have to make my point effectively, I have to make sure that I'm making my point with information to back up what I'm saying, and also kind of keep my composure for thing, things that are uh, emotional and challenging to talk about. So that part of it, of just the dialogue, um, and again, like this is on Zoom, I think in the chambers when we go back, that will be interesting. So we'll have like the microphone and it will feel a lot more intense. But the conversational part of it um, and the research part of it is familiar, but it's just a lot of additional work and time, especially prior to the meetings, making sure we have like everything in a row, making sure we, or I understand the agenda, the issue, I have my talking points. But it's also like things will happen in the meeting public comment will happen or someone will raise a point that is maybe something I didn't think about. So then I'm kind of like, okay, I want to make sure before I speak I have, you know, everything clear so that I can still make my points effectively. But it's certainly a learning curve, I think, in just managing a wide range of different opinions that are all talking to you. Um, and they're talking to all of us in the council, but the emails will be directed to us personally at times and that can be challenging because you, you always want to do the right thing. and you're ultimately going to disappoint people every meeting. <laughs> and um, not intentionally, but someone will walk away from every vote very disappointed in you. And that feels not great, you know, even though we're doing kind of the best that we can. So, yeah. So you were chair of the Portland School Board for two years? Two years. Two chair. years. So there have to be some similarities. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting that the, I, I was... In, I was intrigued to find out how much of that learning curve was going to be either shortened or impacted by having been on the board and, and certainly having been chair. Um, I, I do find, like, like, like Tori was saying, there's a lot of these transferable skills, right? There's a lot of these things that, that I was able to accomplish while being chair that have prepped me for this. 
Um, there's a unique thing about the council and, and the type of issues that we're talking about. And like I said, those emails, um, you know, again, the, the, the pressures are from so many different directions. In the school board, um, things were, you know, I know the school community. I, I know more or less, you know, who's engaged and, and not necessarily know what their positions are going to be, but you, I had a, a, you know, after some time, you have a better sense. So the learning curve, I think, has been helped by, by the school board, but still I consider this to be a, a whole new monster. Yeah. Okay. Um, can I bring up a, a thing about procedure? So, you know, one thing about learning to be on such boards or councils is that you have to learn the process of how the business gets done. And I know that in your first meeting, Victoria, you told me, and I, and I you know, heard from other sources too, that you wanted to bring up hazard pay and, and bring it from the floor. <laughs> Meaning, we're gonna. I'm, I'm a counselor. I can propose. I can make a, a motion right here, right now, about yeah. something. And so, in all good faith, I believe you did so. But then people said, "Oh, well, you know, the reason we really don't do that is mm -hmm. because we want the public to be able to comment. And if we bring something up from the floor and then rush through a vote, then the public." understandably feels like, hey, we didn't get to weigh in on that and send these guys a whole bunch of emails. That's mm -hmm. an important part of this process. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to comment on that? How do yeah. you, how do you it, feel about that now? <laughs> um, yeah, it was, uh, so it was the discussion around the mask mandate and it was, I, I was wondering why we would not enact a mask mandate immediately. There was a lot of back and forth. It did not make the agenda um, in time for, I think it was our second meeting and so in my head, I was like, well, we, we'll just bring it up. Let's bring it up from the meeting, from the floor, and it will be fine because like COVID cases are rising and we need a mask mandate. And um, I was in the middle of kind of doing it. It was kind of, it was like, I was asking all of these questions essentially of like, what would happen if I did this? How would this work? And we were walking through it together, which I actually think was interesting for the public as well, because I always want to be really transparent. And so I was just trying to figure it out on my own and people got to see that in real time. So it's not like she's a counselor, she knows how to do everything. I was like, well, what does it mean if I bring it up from the floor, what's gonna happen? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, there were some comments about saying, if you do this, it's not the most transparent way to do things because it's not on the agenda, which means individuals didn't have a chance to read it, absorb it, prepare for it. And that was definitely an interesting moment of me retracting what I was originally going to do, which I'm glad that I did because I, I can certainly see a way that it would not be well received by individuals who didn't get time, whether they like a mask mandate or not. Everybody needs a fair amount of time to, to understand what we're talking about and what's coming up at the meeting. But it was an interesting moment for me as a new person and as somebody I think that all of my background is in activism. So I was like, this is a thing I want and we'll yeah. bring it up now. And it's kind of like, that's not, a great idea um, and it was it was a it was an interesting moment for a new counselor to have because I was very much saying like okay this is differently this is going differently than I thought but now when I think about issues that I'm passionate about because I have heard like oh they can be brought from the floor sometimes I'm like I'm not doing that I'm just not gonna do it I just think it it does uh, present some issues with being transparent in a big platform I ran on was being transparent and being accessible. And so regardless if, I, I never wanna be acting in my own personal best interest. And I think if I had done the mass mandate from the floor, it would have been my own personal interest of something and not being fair to the individuals that really need the agenda ahead of time, so. Well, I really admire that you were willing to learn right out loud in front of you know the council and all the, the spectators that that's brave mm -hmm. and it's certainly uh, really good for younger people watching going oh my gosh you know we don't have to pretend you know there's always this sense of like to pay no attention to the man behind the curtain right. the great Oz is speaking <laughs> and people are tired of that and yeah they, they try I think it, it raises the level of trust in a public institution when people are more human and you know able to not try to always have this facade that's going to going to be perfect um, yeah, and I, I don't, and that absolutely won't be the fir first or last time that that happens where I'm like, well, what happens if I do this? Why can't I do that? And I'll ask it live in the meeting. I mean, that's why we have, you know, the corporation council there and that's, that's, that's part of it. And I, I actually, I appreciated that moment even though I was definitely like breaking the rules without trying to. Um, I think it was a good moment that humanized me as a new person of saying like, well, I'm always gonna ask these questions even if people are like, why doesn't she know this? It's kind of like, well, we're all, we're all learning, you know, what is the best course of action together.
Let's get a little more serious. What do you see as being, you know, one thing this year, this session of the council that you would just love to see accomplished? I'm not even asking you to, to, to tell me whether you think it can be, but in your dreams, what is one thing you would really like to see happen this year? Oh, man. Those like your Hard to pick one. <laughs> it doesn't even have to be that your top one, but, you know, share one with us. Um, oh wow. So yeah, I don't think I have like any like one specific one that I would highlight as like the top one and even like this without really like thinking ahead of it. Um, I think I have like some personal growth ones, but as far as like policy stuff, um, I've been, I keep going back to the recall process like happening and, and it being a huge opportunity. Everyone that I talked to through the campaign talked about how valuable the recall process is to, to talk about rezoning and reusing parts of Portland to maximize, you know, appealing to developers to get housing built, to get affordable housing, to get housing for all income levels. So I really, I want to be aggressive and I've talked to other counselors and I've talked to the mayor about this. I want to make sure that we address the recode process, that we have access to the recode process so that we can have public input, counselor input, and when we have opportunities to look at entire zones, not just like in this like little parcels one at a time the way we get them from the planning board, but when we're looking at entire areas of the city, we can talk about, okay, what's the future? What's this going to look like in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? Um, and not, you know, have we had a discussion this week about one parcel, one small, um, you know, code change request that to me, I was like, no, I don't want to like just, you know, micromanage this city this way. I want to look at the big process and it's happening right now, you know, mostly led by city staff. So to me, that's like, I keep feeling pressure to like get that out there and, and how, I don't know what that looks like. It might be a committee that we put in place that updates us more often than what the council is getting right now. It might be, um, in the past, there was an ad hoc committee that was put in place for short term. So I, I'm exploring different ways, but that to me, as far as the long term, uh, you know, affordability of the city and everything that we talked about as the biggest issues coming into the campaign, um, that to me is, is a key way to get in there. Okay, so you're kind of a big picture guy. Like, I can't understand what this little piece means unless I know kind of what the big picture and, and, mm. and, and we can influence that process. I mean, the public getting in there, and when we start talking about aligning to the comprehensive plan, equitable access to the waterfront, equitable um, green spaces. You know, my organization, I was talking about cultivating community. You know, when we talk about climate justice and, and environmental racism, we're talking about the lack of access to green spaces from marginalized communities, people of color, black people, immigrants. And so we're in a city that's, that's looking at how do we develop for the future? What, are, what is our outdoor space is gonna look like? And if we don't consider things like that, you know, uh, what are we, how are we going to maintain access to green spaces? To me, that's a huge, huge issue. And the recall process can, can open the doors for us to maximize that. And if it's happening without public input or without us in, in the room to help uh, influence it, um, I see us as just being, again, a missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. okay. What about you, Victoria? I love all of that. I agree with all of that. And I'm, I'm excited, too, because we're both on sustainability and transportation. And so um, that committee will be, I'm, I'm just thinking there's a lot of work to be done. And I'm really excited to work both on it because I think, you know, leading with equity, there there is a lot of conversations that we can have about what the future of climate looks like in Portland, what the future of transportation looks like in Portland. And so, like, these are super exciting conversations that I'm excited to dive into. We've only had one meeting, but I'm already like, OK, here are some really exciting initiatives that we could put in place to really make sure that climate is also seeing and representing all of us because I, I still think it's a really white centered issue when I think about, you know, <clears throat> people of color, people in vulnerable communities, disenfranchised communities who are going to be the most affected by climate impact but had the least amount of resources. And so I really want to make sure that when we have these conversations that we're bringing everybody to the table to be part of it. So I, I love, you know, everything that was just said and I think like some personal you know, goals of mine are participatory budgeting. I would love to, to see get off the ground. I, I know that that's, that's going to be a lengthy one. Could you explain um, that a little bit for our viewers? Yeah, I mean, I think just the process of city budgeting and it being a really democratic, democratic process and being kind of a, a citywide process where we can all be part of that conversation. And it's not just like this kind of high level um, dialogue that doesn't involve a lot of the people in Portland, especially the people that it's really going to affect the most. And so I think when I talk about, because my line I think I always say is like, we can shape the city that we want. And I really mean that, especially right now, because we're still a large town and this is still a space where we haven't 
you know, gotten to a level where we don't know our neighbors yet. Yeah. I mean, it's happening, but we're still in a time where we can have uh, individuals, especially young people, especially people of color, really get involved in conversations around city budgeting and getting involved in, in, in saying, we want to shape it so that we can put down roots, we can have kids, we can invest in our schools, and we can make sure that Portland continues to be a community-based area. So again, I think it's gonna take some time, probably like the entirety of, of my, my council term, but I think being able to start the study with what that looks like in other cities and, and whether or not it could be possible here to implement, uh, I'm really excited about. I'm also excited personally about um, you know, having, I, I guess just having conversations around how we can ensure that we are investing more in young people that are, that want to put down roots in Portland and that want to start families in Portland and making sure that we're investing in them in a way where they feel like, okay, this is a place for me. I have opportunities here. I have, I have job opportunities here. I can make a living wage here and I'm not being priced out by Airbnbs or developments and I'm not feeling like I'm no longer, you know, getting to call this place home. And so again, I think that that's gonna tie into every conversation that we have is around housing, around climate, but I'm excited to make sure that we're bringing more young people and more people of color to all of these conversations and getting them excited to be part of, of the movement of, of Portland. And then my own small personal one that I have is we have, um, we're starting to become a little bit of like a marijuana hub, which is like very interesting and, and definitely exciting. But I also think there's a missed conversation around um, talking about marijuana and, yep. and how it, it disproportionately affects uh, black individuals and, and really sends them to jail. I think black men are, are we have majority of black men in jail uh, serving sentences for weed. And then we have weed stores opening up in Portland that are looking like small versions of Google. So I'm trying to figure out how we can make sure that if people wanna do that, how are they giving back? How are they investing in, in trying to get, um, you know, black individuals out of jail who have very small amounts of weed and are serving sentences that are, you know, 10 to 15 years. And I think that that, when I, whenever I wanna to point to a level of blatant systemic racism, I always talk about that because like you can't, you, you can't really work your way around why that, why that happens. And so, you know, I don't know what that would look like, but I would love for it to be a multi-municipal approach with Westbrook and with South Portland and with Biddeford and saying, how do we make sure that as we continue to be cool and as we continue to have these places open, that we're not forgetting the fact that there's a lot of privilege that goes into being able to open up a, a dispensary and not give back to individuals that are serving 10 year sentences in prison who are black, who are doing the same exact thing, so. And such an effect on children when their parents are incarcerated mm -hmm. for any reason, especially like a, a victimless crime, and right. the children really suffer. Yeah. And that seems to be an overlooked aspect of our incarceration nation many times is, yeah, oh, well, this so person like, broke the law. Well, you know, all of us break the laws lots of times, and the question is who gets locked up, who gets taken away from the mm -hmm. family, the income is gone, the, you know, people often lose their housing because one of the parents is in jail. It's just yeah. really a kind of a cascade of bad effects. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm almost sure, and I don't know if this is still um, the, the case, but up, up recently, Maine had the largest percentage of children with at least one, one parent who had been incarcerated. So as, as, as a nation, Maine is probably one of the cases, one of the states that deals with it at the most severe, severe level. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, let me ask you a kind of an off the wall question. Is there anything that has brought you joy about being on the city council so far? It's okay to say no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm think. well, honestly, today I, I yeah. had a joyful oh, moment yes. <laughs> because <laughs> we did, back in October, uh, during the campaign, one of my favorite forums that we did was through Lyman Moore Middle School. So the sixth graders held a student-led forum for the uh, counselors that were campaigning. And those questions were hard. Like, they really I did I not... I say that those were the best questions. It they was, on, and I just yeah. was not, first of all, just so in, impressed with the levels of questions. They did deep dives on all of our websites. They had been following along with the campaign. So, like, things that we had said, they brought up again. And it, just, it was just absolutely amazing. I loved it. But um, they sent us all 
uh, like their own personal endorsements because they were having a mock election. And I had seen that like, Roberto had gotten his and I was so jealous because I was like, wait, did, am I getting one? And months it finally, ago too. Right? Months ago. And it finally came in the mail and it was, it was just great. It was lots of drawings of me and lots of here's why I'm voting for Victoria. Here's why I think she's great. And that felt really good because it really brought me back to saying like, oh yeah, this is like very exciting work and you know, it, it's, it's challenging, but when I think about young people, I hope that there was one student that was really inspired by, by me and is like, I want to be a city councilor. And that alone really, you know, is, is a feeling of saying, okay, I feel like I'm, I'm in the right spot here. So that brought, that brought me some joy. I think just young people who were really excited about us and saying like, I want to be like that is really cool and feeling like you are a role model to, to kids because that's, that's going to be the next wave and the next generation. And so that was, that was nice. That is pretty joyous. Yeah. How about you? Yeah, so um, surprisingly, it was actually one email that I received that completely like brightened my day, and since then it's just really percolated. So someone read an article that the West End News wrote um, where I, I talked about being a therapist, and they recognized me. And so they said, I didn't know who you were, and then I read the article, you treated my mother. You were, my mother was your patient. And that this is a woman that was over 100 years old. She lived in an assisted living facility. I worked with her for years. Sweetest person in the world. And she and I just had a great relationship. So I heard hearing from her, from her daughter. And then she's since passed away. So that was kind of sad. But just to hear her daughter say, like, oh, you were one of her favorite therapists. And it's so good to see you on the council. And I wish you all the best. So that was, like, just a really, like, you know, of all the emails that have come in, like, that one yeah. was like, completely unrelated to the work but a really positive um, kind of like side or like, like Well, it's not unrelated because now yeah, they're you know, you right. the figure and yeah. they Yeah. And then the that. other the other part that I think has been just generally like a positive or like a real uh, good thing like I've I I hope you I don't know I don't know if you relate to this but um, Pius Ali was a big part of me running for the school board initially and one of the things that I always quote unquote like envied about him or, or thought that it was really neat about him is that his day-to-day -day work is so related to the public service. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that has brought me a lot of joy, like I said, is that now my work is so related to it. Like I'm working, you know, like I was said, I was in a meeting with the school department this week talking about like the same issues that I'm advocating for, you know, as a public servant. Mm -hmm. So being in that position and realizing that the council is like just hand in hand with the work that I'm doing every day, that's also joyful. And that, that makes me kind of like, you know, put up with, you know, yes, people are flocking your inbox and there's a lot of like different directions, but you've aligned yourself, at least I've aligned myself, both in my day-to-day -day job and in the, my public service job, that it's, you know, that's joyful. That's been a huge surprise to see it just kind of, yeah, find its way. Well, let's keep talking about it. What a great ending. Thanks so much for being with us. Pathways to Progress, Roberto Rodriguez and Victoria Pelletier. Great conversation. Thank Thanks. you. Let's, let's do this again. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, great. Thanks for watching.